Ladies and gentlemen, uh, well, I'd like to welcome to the stage geologist from Plymouth University, proving to us that rocks rock her world. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's Hazel Gibson. <laughs> Thanks. Hello. So, yes, I'm Hazel and I'm a geologist. And as Helen has said, that is the study of rocks for anyone who didn't know what a geologist is. And by the end of this, I'm really hoping that you're all going to be geologists because it's the best subject in the world. All right. And I mean, I totally love geology. And I, as I say, I think it's the best subject. And I've kind of been trying to think of reasons of how I can prove to you that geology is the best subject in the world. And so I thought, of all my favourite things about geology, and then I thought, well, I haven't got very long, so I'm just going to pick kind of three of my favourite things. So uh, my first favourite thing about geology is that rocks and minerals and fossils can tell you really amazing things about both Earth's past and its future. So scientists have been studying uh, rocks that fall from space called meteorites. And inside these meteorites, you can find tiny, tiny diamonds. Now, the really amazing thing about these diamonds is that they were formed the scientists, some meteoritic scientists that study meteorites have discovered that these diamonds were formed before anything else in our solar system. So actually, you can go and look at these tiny diamonds that come from inside a meteorite, and they're older than anything you've ever seen in your life, except for the stars, which is pretty awesome, right? Now, that's kind of really amazing, but the other thing I like about science, my second favorite thing, really, about geology is that it's a real world science. This is one of my favorite things about it because whether you're kind of going out into a muddy field somewhere where it's pouring with rain and you're being stalked by cows or you're hiking up an active volcano behind someone who's wearing the t-shirt which is really reassuringly printed with the words volcanologist if you see me running try and keep up. <laughs> you know whether, well, either one of those things, you know, then you're, you're, you're getting out there and you're doing it for yourself, which is something that I really, really love about um, geology. Um, my third favourite thing about geology is that you get to use old and really familiar words in new and exciting ways. Yes, I mean, let's face it, geology really is the only science that you could be standing on a street corner having a totally serious discussion with someone about thrust zones, good quality cleavage, and coming tonight. <laughs> You know? You're not going to get away with that in any other science, really. You'd get arrested, but geology's just a bit like that. And my love of geology really started when I was a little girl. And I grew up in Devon. I was lucky enough to live by the sea. And every weekend, my parents would take me and my little sister down to the beach, and we'd be like running around, finding rocks and fossils and shells. And I was always more interested in the rocks and the fossils, let's be honest. And um, We'd go fossil hunting, you know, my parents were quite into taking us out and exploring the outdoor world. And my sister was always way better at fossil hunting than I was. And that used to really annoy me. And then I kind of went, chuh, fossils, I'm going to study rocks instead. And it took me quite a long time to realise that the reason that my sister was better at fossil hunting than me was because she always walked in front of me. <laughs> And so she'd be like, oh, yeah, I found this amazing sea urchin. And I'd be like, a broken shell? What? This is rubbish. But yeah, so we really love to go fossil hunting quite a lot, actually. And one of our favourite places to go fossil hunting was a town on the south coast of England called Lyme Regis. Anyone heard of Lyme Regis? Yes. yes. Lyme Regis is actually quite well known uh, in geological circles and sometimes outside of those as well because it is a brilliant place for fossil hunting. And this was really highlighted as well because it's the, fact, uh, it's the place where one of Britain's most famous geologists lived, a lady called Mary Anning. Uh, Mary Anning was born in 1799, and she was really one of the you know, pioneering paleontologists of her century. Um, but she kind of lived at a time when, as I'm sure you know, society in general wasn't really very supportive of its women scientists. Um, one brilliant example that I love is uh, Thomas Henry Huxley, who was one of the you know, most brilliant and innovative uh, science educators. He actually described, um, uh, wrote a letter to his friend Charles Lyell in 1860, saying that he shouldn't be worried about the competition of educated women because, and I quote, five-sixths of women will stop in the dull phase of evolution. Okay, um, so, you know, count five, six of you, and then, sorry, one of you's the only one that's going to be outside of the doll phase. Um, 
I mean, you also had scientists, it was a really prevalent view. You had scientists like Henry Mauds, uh, Dr. Henry Maudsley, the psychiatrist, who said that a woman taxing her brain made her unsuitable for motherhood. So, I <laughs> don't know how that works, but there you go. Um, it, was, it was a difficult time to be a woman scientist, really, but Mary didn't really care about that. Um, this is Mary Anning, in case you didn't know. Um, she didn't really care about the opinions of society because, for her, um, fossil hunting was both a financial lifeline and a passion. She was taught to do it by her father, Richard, and she used to go along the seashore uh, discovering fossils, cleaning them up, and then she'd sell some of them onto the wealthy gentry at the time. Um, and she discovered hundreds and hundreds of fossils during her lifetime, including some first examples of fossils. So she discovered the first near-complete fossil of an ichthyosaur, kind of looked like a cross between a dolphin and a crocodile, which, you know, if you don't have nightmares about that, then really. Um, you also have uh, the first near-complete example of a plesiosaur, which is even scarier, if you can imagine that. And she also found the first example of, or well, near-complete example, of a pterosaur, one of the flying, um, I'm going to say flying reptiles, because you don't say dinosaur in Ireland. Um, yeah, so she was a really brilliant fossil hunter, but despite the fact that she was recognised by society at the time as being an expert fossil hunter, she was never allowed to scientifically describe or name any of her fossils. In fact, quite often she never even got recognition for the fact that she'd found them. Recognition was given to the wealthy person that had bought her fossil rather than the woman that had dug it out of the cliff. Um, but nowadays, she's really well remembered, actually. She was such a successful paleontologist, probably one of Britain's most famous paleontologists of that era. And um, because she was self-taught, she kind of uh, gained this reputation as being really, really good at being able to recognise geological fossils and specimens and kind of became an icon for British, British people doing paleontology kind of amateur and making it into a profession. And actually now, she's probably better remembered than a lot of her male compatriots who actually published her work. You know, how many people have heard of Henry Delabesh? Not very many. But Mary Anning, she's actually going, well, you can have her on an iPhone and a T-shirt, which I'm actually quite tempted by, to be honest, because, you know, why not? Um, now, the thing about um, Mary and living in Lyme Regis is that she, because she was such a famous fossil hunter... She really brought a lot of prestige into Lyme Regis. And it's now, as I say, a really popular place for people to go fossil hunting. They have a big festival there every year, a fossil festival, which, let me tell you, that's a great festival. <laughs> Glastonbury, forget about it. Lyme Regis Fossil Festival is where it's at, OK? Yes, don't underestimate it. But they do, they have a brilliant fossil festival. But it's not just Lyme Regis. I mean, as a nation, we are massive, enthusiastic amateurs. We love to search for natural history and all kinds of amazing discoveries. So people all over Britain are actually making amazing fossil discoveries every day. And the trouble with being a paleontologist, especially if you're slightly an amateur paleontologist, is that you can kind of get carried away with what you think you've found. And um, sometimes you're overestimating your discoveries. But luckily, it, you know, it's never been easier to get your fossil uh, discoveries identified than it is now with the internet and large scientific institutions that will quite happily have a look at what you found and tell you what it is. Unfortunately, um, yeah, as I say, more often than not, you can be overestimating what you found. So I've got a few pictures of some fossil discoveries that have been sent in, just as an example of this. Um, this fossil hunter thought that this was a fossilised turtle shell. Yeah? Really looks like it. It's actually quite a good... It's not, though, sorry. It's just a rock. It's a really interesting rock. But it is just a rock. Um, yeah, and some things can be even harder to see. This one looks quite obvious. This one got sent in. Um, it's so difficult to work out what it is. They actually really helpfully drew a picture. <laughs> um, I'm going to go with no on that one. Sorry, that's not a fossilised cow. That's an imagination, though. Terrible. But yes, um, and some things are even stranger. Now, this <laughs> is quite clearly a piece of pyrite, which is a mineral more commonly known as fool's gold and grows commonly all over the UK with two really lovely sandstone concretions. Yes? So, as you see, people can often be a little bit overly enthusiastic about their fossil hunting. Um, and people aren't generally yet quite as good as Mary was in working out what's a genuine fossil, a really good fossil to discover, or something that might be a little bit too much imagination. But sometimes these things come good. And um, 
A few years ago, there was a little girl who lived in the Isle of Wight called Daisy. This is Daisy. Um, Daisy Morris, she was um, walking along the beach one day in the Isle of Wight and she found a really strange fossil. Um, and she was convinced it was something really interesting, so they took it to a scientist and had it looked at. And it turned out to be an entirely new species of pterosaur. Now, Daisy was about five when she discovered this fossil, so unfortunately, she couldn't publish the data herself. <laughs> but she was um, credited with the discovery in a scientific journal, something that Mary never had done at her age when she was finding similar fossils. And she also had the fossil named after her. So this, this fossil, uh, it's got a really long first name, but its second name is Daisy Morrissey. So, you know, she's had the fossil named after her. And I like to think that if Daisy continues collecting, she could be a future Mary Anning. She has obviously got the eye for finding a good fossil, except this time, Daisy's going to be able to name and describe her own fossils. Thanks very much. <laughs>